that's just a close up of that same thing you can see that what we call the fibrillation or feathering of the small intestine proximally and the smooth margination of the intestine cob. Okay. Anybody? Isn't that easy? It's so easy. It's interoperative. So make sure you give me a general radiographic diagnosis and then tell me what your differential would be. And this is just tells you what I just mentioned. This is an example of an outflow obstruction. And can you get the impression that there is a soft tissue opacity around the pyloric outflow tract? The stomach is distended. If you think about pyloric outflow, but the most common cause of that would be pyloric stenosis as a cause. Foreign bodies can lodge their end. An infiltrative lesion, infiltrative, neoplasia, inflammation, etc. And there's a small amount of contrast material that we see exiting the stomach. So if there is an, a pyloric outflow obstruction, that, that isn't that general? Pyloric outflow obstruction. So general. <laughs> then I would say that what caused that? Born body, infiltrative lesion, pyloric stenosis, etc. If you think there is an outflow obstruction, then you would expect for the stomach to be descended, right? So do you get that impression? Do you, do you kind of see that there's a, a soft tissue passing there that's narrowing? Of course, you see narrowing of the lumen, but then the soft tissue passing that we see there around that area. So look at this one. This is one where there is irregularity and narrow, narrowing of the outflow tract, irregularity to the duodenum, multiple lesions. What do you think about this narrowing here? See how smooth this one is versus this one? This is what we refer to as an apple core lesion, but very similar to this finding, circumferential. So look at this one and tell me if you can picture that. So it, gives the, so it gives you the impression that there is a circumferential lesion here. The duodenum is very irregular. This one is smooth. So this is an example of peristalsis, both of these. So peristalsis is not going to be persistent. So if you take you take the multiple films, if you're doing an upper GI study anyway. And so if this is truly a lesion, it will repeat on your next set of films. Where his peristalsis would not. So he's just going to move on, moving the contrast material and contents distally. Smooth and marginate again like this one, but not persistent. Upper small bowel obstruction. We talked about that a little bit before. If it is upper small bowel, you, you, you're referring to duodenum and upper jejunum. If it's lower small bowel, you're talking about lower jejunum and ileum. If there's an obstruction lower, you would expect to see a lot more small intestine distended. If it's upper, of course, look at this one. You only see the stomach, then the duodenum, and you see the smoothly marginated filling defect within the lumen. If you see signs of small bowel obstruction, off to surgery you go. If you want to wait around and then increase your chances of perforation, especially if there's contract material, barium is going to cause a severe peritonitis. And then they don't do it. Now, you have a contrast material. Do you still go to surgery? Absolutely. Because you're not going to be down in the abdomen removing the 
foreign body, I removed, I do any uh, intestinal anastomosis or whatever surgery you're doing. Remember, you pull it out of the intestine, they're on, on your drapes, and so you can actually perform surgery on an upper GI study. You just don't want to allow the contrast to, uh, the bowel to perforate. Everybody got that? So don't let anybody say, well, you did a contrast study, so I don't want to go to surgery. Uh, you're good surgeons. You would, do, you would use good technique. You would do the same thing with fecal material. Don't you go to surgery on bowel loop with fecal material? Absolutely. So it's the same concept. Just don't be afraid of the barium. The barium is the same as the fecal material if you use an, an aseptic technique. It's just that if it perforates, while you're waiting, then that causes a problem. So just don't wait around. All right, quick question. All right, linear foreign body. Linear foreign body, anytime you see the bowel loops that are plicated, accordion, pleating, bunching, ribbon candy, all kind, those kinds of descriptions, it is a linear foreign body. It's specifically that means it is attached, the stream is, is usually a stream, it is attached proximally, and the bowel loop just continue to move, peristalsis, climb on the stream because it's trying to get rid of it, but it can't because it is attached proximally. So if a pet sw swallows the stream and it's not attached, then it's not going to cause a linear form back. It's just going to move on through the small intestine. If you see signs of plication, pleated, bunching appearance, always go back and evaluate the oral cavity because a lot of times the string is attached to the base of the tongue or around the tooth. And so you would check that, you would evaluate that. If you see it, just cut it. You don't need to pull it, just cut it. Then it's going to release and continue into the esophagus and then into the small intestine. You still would have to go in surgically and do multiple enterotomies to release the tension on the small intestine. Because sometimes, look how tight these are. So you do your multiple enterotomies and notice that the intestine are pulled out of the abdominal cavity on the drapes. So therefore, it doesn't matter if it's contrast within them. It doesn't matter if it's fecal material within them because you're using an aseptic technique. Linear foreign body, typically a string. Linear foreign body, look at the abnormal gas pattern. Remember the small intestine with gas patterns just have a nice linear um, appearance. But these are like bunch focal areas of gas accumulation. Can you see that? And that looks very similar to this one. Okay, linear form body. So you actually can call that radiographically. There's small bowel disease consistent with linear form body. Off to surgery you go. Okay, this is another one. On the lateral view, you can see how the small intestine are kind of stacked. Look at that and just kind of <coughs> imagine that in the ventral abdomen. And then notice that they are just bunched toward the mesenteric root. But they're not distended. Now all the time are the bowel loops of the linear foreign body distended. It's just a bunching, the plication appearance of the small intestine. Colon. In cats, usually if there's lower, uh, if there's a colonic disease, and of course, pets are presented with different clinical signs than small intestinal disease. Sometimes lower small intestinal disease and colonic disease appear similar on presentation. But in cats, yeah, the normal colon should be less than 1.5 times the length of L7. Now, it's difficult to evaluate colonic disease unless it is distended or the fecal material is very opaque. Just look at this one. Not only do you know that, that you see that the colon is markedly distended, and you can imagine what, 
how uncomfortable or discomfort this pet is, is experiencing. But the fecal material, we use the fecal material to help us uh, come up with a diagnosis as well. If it's very dense, it, give, it tells you that it, the pet is obstipated. There's some reason why the fecal material is not passing. So you think about a lesion in the rectum. Anal sacs would be another good example to look at. In these cats, a neuromuscular disorder common in mates cats. If you happen to see that, if it may be a mates mix, then you think about some of the neurological conditions as a cause of the mate Intersusceptions. Intersusceptions. Intersusceptions are put on, or an and intersusception is put on your differential list when you see signs of small bowel obstruction. Why is that? Because the, correct, the proximal loop invaginates into the distal loop. Well, then look at the lumen. Is that narrowed? Isn't that going to cause some out, some passage of the gas distally? And so then the bowel loop proximally is going to distend. So on a survey film, you put intersusception on your differential. Off to surgery you go, right? Now, if you want to confirm radiographically, sonographically would be your next best yeah. Because what does the sonogram, the ultrasound, show you? It'll show you multiple loops, margins of multiple loops, and you see a loop inside of the loop. You always, you can see the layer, and so you see a loop inside of the loop. Very easily diagnosed with ultrasound. But you cannot diagnose it on the survey film. Even if you do a contrast study. If you do a contrast study, it's just going to tell you that the proximal loop is dilated. It's still not going to tell you that it's in the intersusception. Yes. So you have loops, a loop, which is the inside target, and then an outside target, which is the outside layers. A bullseye, they also refer to that. So you see that you see these. So in, instead of having you know the layers on one side and the other side, you have layers of the intestine two, four, and then on the outside of that lumen as well. It's very typical. When we get the ultrasound, we'll show you one. Okay, so that's what it looks like in the small intestine. So the, the invaginated segment is referred to as the intersusceptum. The outside receiving segment is referred to as the intersusceptum. How do you remember that? I.e. for receiving line, you're receiving something. I.e. receiving intersusceptum. So it's receiving the intersusceptum of the invaginated segment. Now I want you to note Look at the invaginated segment. See how smooth and marginated that is? Now, you're not going to see that unless you put contrast material distal. Right? Just, as, just as assume that this is colon, for example. If you put contrast material distal, then you're actually going to see the invaginated segment. If you do an upper GI, you're not going to see this part, right? Because the contrast is proximal. Did y'all follow that? If this were small intestine, the contrast is abhorrible. So you're, you, you give the contrast material. Does not the contrast material stop here for small intestine? Because it's narrow. So then you see dilation of the small intestine proximate. Okay, now you follow that? Then you make it the colon. But you put in contrast material distally into the colon, so the contrast material, you'll be able to see the invagination in intersusceptum on a colon, colonic study. I'll take a minute. Got that, that? That's why you're unable to see the 
a vaginated segment on an upper GI study because the, distinct, the, the distinction is proximal. Intersusceptions move in the direction of peristalsis, so the proximal goes into the distal. But can it occur the other way around? Absolutely. So you can have the distal segment into the proximal segment, but that's very unusual. So if you did, if that happened and you did an upper GI study, now you'll see the imaginary segment. Right? Just switch it. I see eyes just kind of. Okay, question on that. Nope. So, if the referral is a set, it's suspected to be a set. Do you want to even do the, the ab oral barrier contrast? You just don't make the contrast, right? Correct. Right. right. If, if you're suspicious of the intersusception after you take the survey bounds, then just go straight to ultrasound and confirm it. But if you see dilation of intestinal loops, just go to surgery. You'll tell if there's intersusception there. But sometimes they're not all, they don't present with the typical clinical signs. It may be lower, small intestine, waxing, waning, vomiting, diarrhea, that you don't know. And then you go to ultrasound to know that. Or get an idea that whatever might be going on in the small intestine. Okay, question? Okay, so what does it look like if it were colon? If you did a new mold colonogram or you put contrast material in it, now look at the invaginated segment. Doesn't it look like a mass? It looks a soft tissue opacity. <coughs> in the, this is in the transverse colon. But you wouldn't say this is a colonic intersusception, would you? You would say there is a mass, soft tissue mass, in the transverse colon and then you do a differential. The most common one, especially if it's an adult, would be some type of neoplastic or polyp, benign lesion. There's your chain, C-H-A-N-G, that go your differential, but also add intersusception because an intersusception in the colon can look like a mass because now the contrast, whether it's air or Barium would delineate the invaginated segment or into the cell tongue. Okay, everybody should get that now. Okay. Okay, you have any questions on the GI? Yes. Questions, dog and cat. Question. Um, the previous slide, so. The previous slide? Yes, ma'am. Yes. So the gas is being filled behind the intersusception. Is that what's happening? Intersusception. All right, just don't look at this. Oh, look at the radio graph. Hmm? Um, okay, uh, so the intersusception, is that mm -hmm. gas behind it, or is that a, um, no. Where the intersusception is, the gas, is that where the intersusception is um, located? <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Okay, so that okay, gas so is behind it. it. So that gas is behind it. Okay, the gas is behind distal. Yes. Distal. So here, look at this diagram. This is distal. This is proximal. Now you take the same diagram and made it colon. So now it still goes proximal into distal, and so now the gas is behind. Is caught, excuse me, behind caudal or distal to the intersusceptum. So now you're actually looking at the intersusceptum as a soft tissue opacity. So here's gas in the colon, it comes around like this, go up and come down to the transverse. And now you're looking at this invaginated segment into the transverse colon. But I don't want you to go, wow, the last time I saw one that looked like that, it was an intersusception. So I'm going to call it a colonic intersusception. No, I want you to read it just like you would normally, soft tissue opacity. In the transverse colon, this is an adult. I'm going to give it some type of mass first, benign, malignant. Oh, and by the way, if the deception can do that as well. How about that? That's it. That's it. Thank you. Okay. I am, uh, I got five minutes. 
So, Dr. Vasudeva, I can either stop here, then one of you all would take um, Reno on Friday. I think you all probably need a break right now. I have, I, I have, I, you know this, I did not do anything funny today. <laughs> Say that again? Oh, I can make it up next week. Actually, yeah. Well, you all, you all look like you were following me, so, so that was great. And no, I, I did go back and do my diffuser. I'm going back and do that now. But. Okay, well, you all got to. So, so what, either Dr. Bassett or Dr. Carter would finish up the. the the kidneys and um, you know, the urinary 